So welcome to Robotics One. In today's class, we are going to talk about uh, trajectory generation. Uh, this is a small topic and I want to finish it because there is an assignment on trajectory generation that you can finish once we discuss this topic. Now, this topic is quite important because believe it or not, the techniques that you see for trajectory generation in the case of articulated robots, same techniques can be used for path planning, path generation, or using robot, human robot type of collaboration. So let's think about what do we mean by trajectory and path planning. So in simple words, it means that how the robot goes from point one to point two. And the easiest way to do this is you have the start point, you have the end point, and then depending upon the profile that you need in between, you actually have these intermediate points. And then what you do is you perform inverse kinematics at every stage. You perform inverse kinematics and then actually make sure that the end effector tracks this kind of path that you desire. Now, there is a coordinate space on the joint space, but sequence of movement, they are basically needed to assume or, or to, to finish certain tasks satisfactorily. And that is a controlled movement. It could be a, a segmented straight line motion. So what that means is if you have this trajectory, then you can actually convert this into sort of a segmented region and then choose this segmented region as the trajectory and each segment you are going to perform inverse kinematics. <clears throat> it is important to understand that if you are not going to consider the mass or the inertia effects, then a simple inverse kinematics would work. So no mass or inertia effects. But if you are going to use mass and inertia effects and make sure that despite of this additional weight, mass, dissipating forces, the robot is able to perform the task in hand, then we need to consider the inverse dynamics. So we need to consider the dynamical effects. And this is an important aspect because please understand that sometimes the mass changes. So for an example, if you have a sprayer robot, Okay, you imagine if you have a sprayer robot and this has an end effector and this robot is carrying this spray. It could be a pesticide, it could be something. But as this spray is spread, the total mass that is on the robot end effector changes. So what that means, since the mass is changing, the robot acceleration would be different. So you need to take into account kinematics and dynamics of the robot to make sure that robot is behaving the way you want to. And then on top of it, you need to add some type of a control algorithm. So basically you are gonna have a, some type of a loop that control algorithm will make sure that the robot is performing uh, it in closed loop. So now the next thing is the difference between the path and the trajectory. So what do we mean by path? Path means a sequence of robot configurations in a particular order, but we are not looking at the time of these configurations. So for an example, 
what you have is you have certain robot configurations, but there is no time access. So there is no time. It is just step one, step two, step three, and step four. But as soon as you add time onto the X axis, you are gonna have something called as the trajectory. So for an example, path planning is something like you have this obstacle. So this is the obstacle is going from here to here. This is the path. But as soon as you say that we need to travel in 10 seconds, it becomes the trajectory. And then essentially you add some more granularity, like, hey, here it needs to finish in one second. This path needs to be done in one second. This is in one second, one second, one second, and so on. So this is what it is. Now, what you wanna do is you are gonna specify the timing that how this trajectory or how this path needs to be uh, traveled. Now, there is something called as joint space and Cartesian space. Now, what do we mean by joint space? So as you know, we have a robot that has maybe revolute joints or prismatic joints. So if we specify these joint angles, if we specify these joint angles, then that is the joint space description. So we are describing the motion made by the joint angles. And next thing is Cartesian space description is the motion between the two points that is known at all the time. And what you do is you basically specify that in terms of end effector position. So basically this is what it is. However, there is a problem. As you can see in Cartesian uh, space, the robot can fold onto itself. So basically, as you can see, this robot running into itself problem can happen in a Cartesian space coordinate. But the problem with joint space is when you are going from one configuration to the other configuration, the motion between the two points may be unpredictable. So you specify one joint angle, you specify the second joint angle, but then it is, you don't specify how the transition is happening. So these are two classic ways of describing the motion. And depending upon the, the robot that you are using, depending upon the technique that you are using, you can potentially use either of those, but which uh, the configuration space that actually defines uh, your workspace better is more uh, something that you want to take into account or that is something that you want to use. Now, what are the, the basics of trajectory planning? Now, I want you to understand, say, if you wanna go from point A to point B, what you do is you define first joint and you define second joint. And now you have multiple ways of performing this operation. What you can do is first you can transfer this joint with angle theta one, and then you can actually translate or rotate this joint by theta two. So this could be like a sequential, first apply theta one, then apply theta two. The alternate option is you actually make both of these go slow by, uh, I mean, slowly with different articulation. For an example, here, what you can see is you can have the first joint, second joint, the first joint advances, second joint advances, first joint enters the limit and the second joint kind of advances. So there are different ways these transitions can happen. So for an example, if you want to go from point A to point B, you can have simultaneous motion or you can have sequential motion. But if you have sequential motion, then you want to understand that this joint 
is probably going through 70 degrees. And this joint is probably going through 40 degrees. So what that means is if you want to achieve sort of a synchronized motion, say if you want this robot to go from point A to point B, maybe in 20 seconds, point A to point B, then you need to make sure you are you have appropriate joint velocities to go from initial position to the final position in 40 degree uh, for uh, uh, 10 seconds and for second point point a to point b in uh, 10 degrees so we desire to move the robot and then we need to make sure that we don't exceed the joint limits of the robot and then we need to make sure that the joint is able to rotate at the speed that we want it to rotate. Now, what are the basics of trajectory planning? So the idea is the motions of the both joints are normalized with a common factor so that the smaller motion, the joint with smaller motion will move proportionately slower compared to the joint with larger motion. This is an important observation. So if you want some type of synchronization, then what you want to do is you want to divide both the, the joints uh, by certain common factor so that both of these motions are in sync. So what it means is when the actual trajectory is traveled, both the joints move at different speeds, but they are going to move continuously together. So different speeds. but moving together. Here, there is a problem. So what that means is the trajectory that is traced by these two joints is going to be different. So again, if you look at the joint space, you need to map the joint space correspondingly so that the requirements for the trajectory are satisfied. If you are working in the Cartesian space, you will be performing the inverse kinematics to make sure the, the requirement or restrictions on the trajectory are satisfied. Now, again, it is very important that you need to add some type of synchronicity between these two. So basically, both of these joints should work in sync. Now, what are the basics of trajectory planning? So we assume that the robot's hand follow a known path between joint point A and point B with a straight line. And the simplest solution here is going to be drawing a, a straight line between point one and point six, and then basically map these individual angles. So for an example, if the joint one angle, this is the joint one, and this is the joint two. If the joint one angle is alpha, and the joint two angle is beta, then alpha will go through the sequence of 20 degrees, 14 degrees, all the way over here, and beta will go from 30 degrees, 55 degrees, 69 degrees, all the way to 80 degrees. What that means is this alpha is going to go from 20 to 40. This is going to be 20 degrees. And this is going to go from 30 to 80, which is 50 degrees. But then the overall motion would be in sync. So the next part is what we want to do is whenever we have some type of a trajectory planning problem, we need to make sure the actuators or the, the motors are capable of driving the robot or they are strong enough to drive the robot uh, through the required uh, velocities and acceleration. 
because for some reason, if we specify a trajectory and the motor is not able to fulfill or satisfy those trajectory requirements, either the robot will not perform or the motors or the actuators will burn out. So every time you are looking at the feeds and speeds or you are looking at certain trajectories, then you need to make sure that the robot, the actuators of the robot are able to perform the operation. So the motors are strong enough, they can supply enough torque for this particular motion from point A to point B. Now, the, the part here is we want to divide this segment differently. And then what we do is we will perform, uh, the segment will move small, and then we will have a constant cruising rate. And then what we are gonna do is we are gonna have the smaller segments as we are reaching the destination. So this is something very important because when we are trying to perform a trajectory operation, we have to be careful about approach and descent. So basically, we want to make sure the transition from one phase of the trajectory to the other phase of the trajectory is smooth. So the next thing is uh, what you want to do is if you want to go a step further, like how do we want to perform the trajectory planning between multiple points? Now we want them to be continuous. So how do we want to do it in multiple points? So uh, then what we want to do is we do something called as stop and go type of motion. Uh, this problem is actually you must have seen this a lot in 3D printers. Like if you look at the 3D printers, the 3D printers, they have this stop and go type of motion. Now, what I want to, uh, I want you to look at is there is new 3D printer in the market, which is called as Bamboo Labs. And I want you to take a look at that Bamboo Lab 3D printer. And the, the beauty of the 3D printer is you have these trajectory calculations done automatically as the part is being printed. So what does that mean? It means you can increase the speed of 3D printing significantly. So that's why if you look at the Bamboo Lab uh, Carbon X 3D printer, uh, if it takes the regular FDM 60 minutes, that uh, 3D printer can 3D print in 12 to 15 minutes. So that is the advantage of uh, basically using real-time feed and speed manipulation. So one thing I want to mention here is uh, if you have some type of a closed loop control, you can certainly be able to uh, uh, get this system performed in a better fashion. But if you want to make sure that you are meeting the desired uh, requirements of the motion, you are also making sure that you are not exceeding the overload limits of the motors and actuators. And many a times, because of these motions, you have additional stresses on the joints. So you need to make sure that all this, uh, and these, these are conflicting requirements. For example, if you want to go from point A to point B, you want to go uh, as quickly as possible. But if you decide to go as quickly as possible, there is a possibility that the motor would exceed the speed, desired speed, or uh, the bearing uh, would overload. So these, requirements that you need to take into account and make sure that you are meeting sort of you come up with a golden mean to ensure that uh, not only the hardware is safe but you are able to get the system working continuously as per your required requirements now one thing 
I want to tell you is when we talk about trajectory planning, there are different ways of doing trajectory planning. And as a bare minimum, this trajectory planning is, if you think about it, it's like a, a very simple polynomial fit. So you want to go from point A to point B, and depending upon how you want to go, if you want to minimize the velocity, if you want to minimize the acceleration, or if you want to make sure the blending is smooth, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, what you do is you use a proper blending. So what we want to do is this is the very first way of performing the trajectory planning. So what you have is you use different polynomials. You use polynomials of different orders. And what you do is you use linear functions with parabolic blends. So what does that mean? At bare minimum, you go from point A to point B. And as you go from point A to point B, you try to fit a polynomial function. You fit a polynomial function. So for an example, your polynomial would be something like C0 plus C1t plus C2t square plus C3t cube. So you have the polynomial, something like this. Now, if you want to find out these individual coefficients, so this is the equation for the displacement, so theta. So what you are going to do is, you are going to take the derivative of this. So this will give you theta dot. And we substitute theta dot. So C1, 0 becomes 0. You get C1 plus 2 C2t plus 3 C3t square. You can also add acceleration, theta double dot. Then you get 0, you get 0, you get 2 C2 plus you get 6 C3t. Now check this out. If I substitute t is equal to 0, if I substitute t is equal to 0, this term goes, this term goes, this term goes. So value of theta at time t is equal to 0 is going to give me the value of c0. So then if I want to find out the value of c1, then what I would do is I would substitute the value of theta dot at t is equal to 0 and I would get value of c1. And then I get value of uh, t uh, is equal to 0. Then I get value of c2, which is acceleration. And this value comes from something called as the jerk. If you want to find out the value of jerk, then you get value of c2. And many a times, theta uh, uh, triple dot is jerk and it can be treated as zero. So if theta, then clearly the value of C3 is going to be zero. So again, there are various ways of doing it. Many a times what happens is at the initial stages, you can have straight lines and then in between, you can have the parabola. You can have the parabola. And uh, that is something that you want to be careful is you want to find out that which one is the best way to do it. So many a times uh, you can uh, look at a very simple trajectory or you can look at the parabolic blends at the end. And I have seen sometimes they use the parabolic blend in between. So for an example, imagine that you want to go from uh, point A to point B. So you have three points, point A, point B, and point C. So what you do is here you have linear parabolic blend, linear, linear parabolic blend, linear. So you can actually go uh, 
depending upon your system requirements. Now, again, there are lot lo and lots of trajectory planning approaches. And again, depending upon your requirement, you can cho choose uh, appropriate values of uh, uh, trajectories. So one thing I want to tell you is uh, the trajectory planning is uh, actually gives you different types of result based on the different algorithms that you choose. Now, you can choose an algorithm that is suitable for uh, your application. Sometimes one approach may give good results. Sometimes the same approach in a different configuration or different requirement may not give you good results. So you want to be super duper careful. And sometimes what you want to do is you want to actually change the algorithm depending upon the runtime. And this is actually super important is if you look at that, uh, 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 the Bamboo Lab 3D printer, you will actually notice that the trajectories are planned in runtime. So even though you create a formal G code, and here is something I want to tell you. So what happens is you, if you are 3D printing, at the end of the day, 3D printer is a robot. So you have the solid part, STL. Then what you do is you slice it. So you have slicer. Then what you do is you kind of create layer by layer. And to generate each layer, what you do is you come up with X, Y, and Z positions. And then these X, Y, Z positions are converted to joint angles. And then you have the extruder positions. And this is actually fed, this actually information is converted in something called as the G code. This G code is a standard technique that is used for numerically controlled machines. So these are called as NC machine. Typically, when you have a G code, you are going to supply specific feeds and speeds. So they are feeds and speeds are defined uh, when the G code is generated. So every G code starts with a header and then it specifies the speeds and feeds and then you actually use those seeds and speeds to find out uh, what is happening uh, with the with the part. The problem there is those sometimes are limiting. In other words, even though sometimes the 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 geometry is super simple, but because of the way that uh, G code is written, it is not possible to make any changes in runtime. So it is extremely important that the settings are appropriate before you generate a G code. Now what this robot can do, such as Bamboo Lab robot, what it can do is it can actually modify those algorithms, modify those values, the G code values in runtime so that you can actually uh, achieve a lot more granularity or a lot more control over the system. So with, with that, you can actually generate uh, higher speeds and higher feeds, and that would be able to get you uh, great results. Now, here is a simple example. So what you have is you have a robot, the six axis robot, but what we are looking at is we are looking at just one angle and it's going from the 30 degree initial angle to 75 degree initial angle. So what we want to do is we want to use a third order polynomial, which is given by something like this. So what we do is we want to find out what is the coefficient C1, what is the coefficient C2, and what is the coefficient C3. And the classic way of solving this is just like uh, differentiate and find out the initial value, find out, uh, substitute the final value, 
and then take the derivatives and then find out the values of the coefficient. So for an example, let us, let's see what we have here. We have at 30 degrees, so initial at t is equal to zero, the initial value is 30 degrees, t is equal to five seconds, you have 75 degrees. So what you do is you take these values this is the initial condition. This is the final condition. And then uh, the velocities are zero. So you can take the derivatives, substitute is equal to zero and get the values of C1 and C2. So next example, which I want to talk to you about is if you have a single link robot, wherein you have the rotary joint, and you want to move this joint from a smooth fashion from theta is equal to 75 degrees all the way uh, in three seconds. So we have to find out the coefficients of a cubic that accomplishes this motion and brings this manipulator to the rest. And we have to plot the position, velocity, and acceleration. The technique is again similar. So what you do is you use the uh, third order polynomial, take the derivative, equate it to uh, the appropriate values. So theta is equal to 15 degrees when time is equal to zero. Theta is equal to 70 degrees when the time is equal to three seconds. And then you come up with this equation. And at the end, what you do is you generate a plot of time onto x axis and theta, theta dot, or theta double dot on y-axis. So that is how you can solve this problem. As a matter of fact, uh, just something to keep in mind that you have exact same problem with different numbers in your assignment. So I would encourage you to look at that problem and answer any questions uh, I'll ask any questions you may have. I would be happy to answer those questions either over email or I can answer those questions in next class. So then if you want to go a step further, you do something like a fifth order polynomial. And what happens when the fifth order polynomial in fifth order polynomial, again, you need additional information. When you say additional information, you are going to need the initial and final acceleration for the segment. So you will have some initial acceleration and you will have the final acceleration. So again, for this, the number of boundary conditions that you need are six. So what you are going to do is exact same technique. You are going to take the, the equation. Then you are going to take the, this is the equation. This is theta t. This is theta dot t, and you have theta double dot t. And then what you do is you actually substitute those values and then get the values of those coefficients, c1, c2, c3, and so on. Now, next thing, which is possible, <laughs> and which is used quite often, is linear segments with parabolic blends. Now, we want to make sure that the transition between different segments is smooth. So what that means is you have initial point, this is initial point, and then you have this next point, and this two trajectories, they are transitioning properly. So this trajectory transition is taking place. So you want to make sure that either the velocities before the transition, they match, or acceleration before the transitions match, or the displacement before and after the transition, they match. Because you can't have two different displacements or two different joint values at the same time. So you want to make sure that we are tracking that transition correctly without undue velocity changes, jerks, and acceleration. So the advantage of this is if you look at the parabolic section, the, the acceleration is constant. 
So if you have the linear segment, acceleration is zero. The problem with a linear segment is since acceleration is zero, uh, you can't move quickly. So if you have a linear segment with parabolic blend, you can start smoothly and then kind of basically merge into the next part. So you can actually start initially, merge into the next one and finally blend into the last one. So this is how this blending would happen. And in order to make sure the blending is proper, you need to make sure before the transition, whatever is the value of theta, value of theta before the transition is value of the transition after. You can impose additional constraints, theta before transition is equal to theta dot after transition. The problem, only problem that you will notice is in the linear segment, Typically, your acceleration theta double dot is going to be zero. And here, theta double dot is going to be constant. So this is something that you want to be careful about when you are using linear segments with parabolic blends. Now, a slight variation that is possible is you can use the linear segment with parabolic blends and wire points. So you can choose linear segment with parabolic blends and wire points. In this case, you have T0 is known. And what you do is you perform the inverse kinematics. And what you do is you add these transition points, which are called as wire points at the end of the motion. And to blend these motions together, the boundary conditions at each point are used to calculate these parabolic segments. So what you do is you calculate these parabolic segments using these boundary points. And here is kind of one example. So this, this is here shown as the linear segment. This is here the linear segment. But if you add the parabolic blend in the beginning and parabolic blend in the end, what you can do is you can actually make this motion smoother. Other way to do that is you can actually have a parabolic blend here and you can have something like here. And then the, the thing here is depending upon what you choose, uh, what type of uh, interpolation function you choose, you are going to have different velocities and acceleration profiles. And some in some cases, you want to be careful that the velocities before and after they match. Uh, in some cases, they may not match, but at that time you want to be careful that the variation is not too much, otherwise you will see jerks. And that is very important. If you have observed 3D printers, you will notice as the 3D printers are 3D printing complex geometry, you will see some type of vibration or some type of a jerky motion in the 3D printers. And that jerky motion, uh, if not controlled, that will affect the quality of the 3D printed part. So you want to be extremely careful when you are using trajectory planning or you are using linear segments, parabolic blends, and if you are using wire points. Now, another thing that is possible is you can actually add intermediate points and then you can have some type of slope definition there. So for an example here, you want to go from different angles at different times. And as you can see, see, these transitions are sharp. So what you can do is you can actually add the parabolic blend straight, parabolic blend straight, parabolic blend straight, parabolic blend straight, and parabolic blend so that these transitions are smooth. Now you can go for a higher order trajectories, but the problem with using higher order trajectories is the number of boundary conditions that you need to get these higher order trajectories is more. And you need to take into account the initial values and final values before you actually implement uh, the trajectory equation. So what you need to do is you need to look at the initial equations 
and then you need to look at the the conditions for the at the beginning of the trajectory at the end of the trajectory and then actually you have to perform extensive calculation and many a times these extensive calculations may not be needed but that completely depends upon what is your goal say for an example uh, i give you a very simple example say if you are operating a da vinci surgical robots that surgical robot motion needs to be ultra fine because you are dealing with a human tissue so there the trajectory planning is done with much much higher blending and much much higher accuracy so that if you see the da vinci robot for surgical operations that that can actually peel the banana strand by strand that robot is capable of blending or or actually peeling the banana or actually stitching a, a tissue so that ultra fine motions are needed and they, they use piezoelectric stages to use uh, achieve these ultra fine motion so basically you will have to perform a lot more calculation at each joint for this higher order polynomial the other classic operation operation is in semiconductor manufacturing so the automation machine or robots that are used for semiconductor manufacturing their accuracy is significantly higher and because uh, you are looking at uh, the, the wavelength of the light and you are trying to manipulate the the 3 nanometer or 5 nanometer interference so you need to have ultra fine resolution or ultra fine motion to achieve that type of uh, interference and and produce the parts that have 3 micro nanometer resolution or 5 nanometer resolution now how would you perform a cartesian space trajectory and cartesian space trajectory is actually a very simple algorithm wherein you are going to perform the sequential inverse kinematics then what you do is you have a cartesian reference frame and you actually find the joint values repetitively so what you are going to do is you are going to go from point a to point b and then you are going to have these intermediate points and now you are going to make this finer 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 and then you are going to find out the intermediate joint values so you are going to perform inverse kinematics at every point stage so you are going to perform the inverse kinematics at every location and then come create a g code and feed that g code and then loop through that again and again so that uh, the robot can go from point a to point b however here is the problem with cartesian space trajectories so in cartesian space trajectories please understand that robot can fold on to itself so for an example if you have a robot like this there is a possibility that this robot end effector can fold on to itself uh, before achieving certain point so for an example if your trajectory is going from like this to this you need to make sure that robot can go like this and not like this because this is not an acceptable configuration so there is a possibility that intermediate points may or may not be achievable you can also have some singularities and you can also have high joint values near the singularities and you can have multiple solutions and end and start can be achieved using multiple solutions so your path planning trajectory planning algorithm should be smart enough to make sure to choose the appropriate trajectory that is well within the limits of the joint and also well within the capability of the robot and it is safe to surrounding which means you don't want that robot swinging around and hitting the humans that are close to that robot so these are come some of the problems that you should address when you are looking at the cartesian space trajectories so with this we are done with this trajectory planning uh, chapter and there is a homework or um, assignment that on the trajectory planning i think you should be able to do that uh,
and I'm going to stop here today. But if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer. Any questions from anyone? If there are no questions, uh, I will stop here. Everyone is on track on the assignments. Okay, fantastic. If there are no other questions, um, I wish you all a great week ahead and I will see you next week. Thank you very much and have a good night. The last day to submit all the assignments, it's 28 of April. That is the last day of class because I need to post the grades. So I don't know if you got that, but last day to submit all the assignments. I mean, I cannot give you any more extensions after 28 of April. 20 of, 28 of April is the last day. Yeah, you can submit lab five next week. That's not a problem. Okay, there is something in the chat window. Uh, not any assignment, the pending assignments. So if you have turned in the assignment, don't. So, but if you have missed any assignment and if you want to turn it in, uh, you can turn it in before 28th of April. Because uh, on 29th, I have to post your grade. So 28th of April is the last day I can accept your assignment. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, file assignment five, six, and seven, as long as they are submitted before 28th of April, uh, you will not lose any points. Okay, all right. Uh, I will see you next class. Yeah, what is with the conveyor belt problem? Purnesh asked some question. I don't know. You will have to look at the assignment. I don't know. I don't remember what was in the assignment, but take a look at assignment. And uh, I think I have a, I, I kind of explained that in the assignment, what needs to be done. So, so take a look at the, the assignment. Okay. All right. I will see you in next class.